Dear ladies and gentlemen, my name is Frank Wolf. Please let me welcome you in the name of the conference organizer, the Center for Contemporary History at Potsdam, our generous sponsors, the Bundeszentrale für politische Bildung with the Andrea von Braun Foundation, as well as many cooperative partners, namely the American Academy, Bard College Berlin, the Centre Mark Bloch Berlin, the Institute for Migration Research and Intercultural Studies at Osnabrück University, and our host here, the Berlin Wall Memorial at Bernauer Straße. In the next days, we will discuss a variety of topics related to European migration, mostly after 1989. Tomorrow, right in the morning, you will hear more about the thematic background of the conference and its program. Today, as a start, we can focus on Peter Cattrall's presentation. It will guide us toward the year 1989 and I think also beyond, and introduce one of the key categories for the next days, the term, the concept, the idea of refugees or the refugee. When we first considered the mere idea of organizing the, this conference or any conference on migration, and well before we came to refine a program on it, we already agreed that there could be only one person to open this conference, and this was Mr. Peter Cottrell. We were deeply impressed by his uh, latest book, The Making of the Modern Refugee, published with, first with Oxford University Press in 2013. In this book, Peter Cottrell traces the interdependence of first violence-induced migration and mass displacement all through the 20th century, and second, the eventually forming idea of the refugee as a distinct category of mobility and protection. For me, the book is a role model study. It, ex it exemplifies, first, how migration history can combine a captivating narrative with sharp analysis. Secondly, it demonstrates a smart and convincing access to global history as it uses one idea, the concept of the refugee, to write a truly global history of the 20th century. This book has been widely praised. Dirk, Ho Dirk Hörder called it a magisterial survey, survey and analysis. Karl von Tempo in the American Histor Historical Review considered it a starting point for anyone who wants to understand the recent historical roots of refugees. And Leslie Page Moore summarized it as a key book that should light the way for more work on displacement and other forced migrations. To our pleasure, Peter Gattrell agreed to come to Berlin and to present some of his key thoughts in order to, as well as we hope in Leslie Page Moore's words, light the way for our upcoming panels and talks during the following days. Like not so few migration historians, actually, Professor Gattrell has a background in modern Russian history and extended this view toward um, or over modern Europe to global questions. He teaches at the University of Manchester and has published widely on topics related to migration, displacement, and the concept of refugee, including both, and that is important, the aspect of war and violence and the relevance of humanitarianism and human rights in the 20th century. What makes this work particularly outstanding is, at least in my eyes, a unique combination of global history, of a global history of politics, concepts, and categories on the one side. And on the other side, the reader hears voices of refugees and is guided through changing self-perceptions and experiences all through the century up to today. This complex relation between governance and agency, or we could say regulation and experience, is one of the key aspects of our conference. And today's keynote lecture, followed by a short discussion round, will introduce us to this interdependence. Therefore, with no further ado, please warmly welcome Professor Gattrell, who will now talk on the making of the modern refugee concepts and experiences. Well, 
Professor Wolf, thank you very much for those warm words of welcome, and uh, I hope I can live up to the introduction. I do want to echo his remarks and, and thank the organisers and uh, Professor Wolf's team for, uh, for making this event possible. I thought I might say that the University of Manchester is still uh, in the United Kingdom, and the United Kingdom is still a member of the European Union, but I thought we would leave that discussion for, for another time. Um, I'm a historian by training and by background and, and interests, and it's in that sense that I want to offer these reflections. I begin by saying something that I don't think is very controversial, which is that if you look at much of the historiography of the 20th century, one of the things that is very striking is that refugees, if they're mentioned at all, have a kind of walk-on part in the big histories of the 20th century. But there's also an uneasy relationship between history and refugee studies, which is a field that has developed quite rapidly and quite successfully over the last quarter of a century or more. Uh, but is primarily social scientific in its orientation. And so history, in my words, is something of an interloper. So there's a very uneasy relationship, it seems to me, between refugees, history, and refugee studies. But taking up what Frank says in his concept paper, um, it seemed to me that here's an opportunity to think about the relationship between history and policy making and policy decisions. And a particular interest of mine is that of histories of categorization or classifica classification or, or labeling or what a, a philosopher has called making up people. And then another thing I want to try and uh, address in my presentation is if we think about the history of Europe, where is it that we put refugees in that broad history and not to mention other parts of the world beyond Europe? And I also want to ask the question, what is it about Europe and where in Europe should we be looking in answer to this question? I may not have time to develop the argument, but I also wanted to say something about the relationship between refugees and states. Because in essence, what I would want to argue is that there's clearly a relationship in the sense that states make refugees through embarking on war or collapsing states through civil war, in a sense, make refugees. But we can also turn that relationship on its head and ask to what extent refugees help to make the state. But whatever we think about these questions, it always seems to me that we have to insist upon a relationship that is very multiple or multifarious in, in its essence. So the actors involved in this history can never be compartmentalised between states and refugees. There are states, there are refugees, there are non-governmental organisations, there are intergovernmental organisations. And of course we mustn't forget that refugees are an active part in making their history, including as historians of their own displacement. And my overall contention would be that what I would like to propose is that we need a history of what I call refugeedom, and I'll say something more about that in a moment. To think beyond ideas of refugee crisis or, or refugee regime, um, and to think about something that is more of a kind of composite or matrix of relationships, which includes cultural representations. There's a very lovely passage in one of the short essays by the French theorist Roland Barthes, in which he has this excellent phrase about the eternal essences of refugees. So in what sense can historians help to, to question or to problematise the essentialization of refugees? When we think of cultural representations, um, of course, everyone in this room will be familiar with the image on the left, and I haven't chosen the image of the young boy, Island Cordy, lying on the beach, uh, but instead being lifted uh, as a dead body. Um, but it seemed to me that the way in which that spoke to many people in 2015 
uh, had, for me at least, powerful echoes of something that happened a century earlier in the Russian Empire when there was a refugee crisis uh, of great magnitude and when one of the images that haunted me when I wrote about this was that of a, a couple of Latvian refugees who were making their way to the interior of Russia and were photographed with their dead child. But cultural representations extend in other directions as well. You can go online and buy a model refugee family. Uh, admittedly, when I did so, it came in pieces, so I, you, you have to assemble it and you have to paint it. But this was the image that appeared on the website of the, of the company that was selling soldiers and weaponry. But obviously some bright entrepreneur or member of the team had decided, well, you can't have war without refugees, so let's sell model refugees as well. But of course there is something for the historian very remarkable about the way in which this is any refugee family. You know, there's no history, there's no context you know, behind this, even though I suspect the person who designed it was thinking of, of Bosnian refugees in the 1990s. And on the right, I'm not going to give you too many images, uh, but on the right is something that also struck me as deeply unsettling and problematic. This was the image that was portrayed on the cover of a magazine of the British Young Conservatives. So this is not the Socialist or Labour Party, this is the Young Conservatives, who have a magazine called Crossbow. And in 1958, they decided that we, as Young Conservatives, need to do something about the refugees in where? In Europe. The displaced persons, amongst whom there were several thousand still in camps 15 years after the end of the Second World War, in Germany and Austria primarily. Palestinian refugees, refugees from China who ended up in Hong Kong, and even some Russian refugees who were very old who were still in China. So they mounted this campaign which became internationalized. And it's a very remarkable campaign. And I have written about this. But to see this photograph as a kind of launch of the campaign is very problematic because what they decided to do was to choose a young girl. Again, there's no name, there's no context for this. And we don't know whether she was photographed uh, on floorboards, in a room, on a ship. We don't know whether she's alive or dead, sleeping. And then, of course, I don't need to reinforce the point about the way in which her clothes have been arranged or she's been photographed as if, if to say uh, that this is someone who is extremely vulnerable. Has she, been, has she been assaulted? We just don't know. So images can be very, very powerful and, and, and can speak to us in all sorts of ways. But there's something for the historian troubling about the way in which these are often presented out of context by the people who chose them in the first place. Now, because I've given you some images, I can now overload you with a bit of text. I want to suggest that to try and make sense of the totality of displacement and its effects and its management in the 20th century, we could do a lot worse than appropriate the term refugeedom, which is my translation of a Russian term that circulated in 1915 through to 1917 in Russia, Bieżenstvo. And I have in mind uh, tracing the history of successive arrangements, particular arrangements for managing refugees in different places and at different times. So we have to think about the emergence, about the evolution, about the problematic contest very often and negotiation that takes place and the exclusion of some people from the regime of refugeedom. So this is a 20th century history. It's not a history of post-1989. It's not a history of post-1951. It's a 20th century uh, history. And of course, we can agree, I hope, that refugees for historians are 
the result of world wars, wars of decolonization, wars of civil war factions. But as I said a moment ago, I also want to try and underscore the argument that there is a, an obverse or a reverse relationship that refugees help to constitute the state at the same time. But we must always bear in mind that refugees are not objects, even though lawyers and bureaucrats and others may turn them into the object of attention, humanitarianism. Uh, nevertheless, we should think as historians of refugees as active participants in their own history. And the last point here is to draw attention to what was going on in Russia when they coined this term, refugeedom, was a term that was designed to draw attention to a change of status, that people had changed, something had changed about those people. And that change of status is, I think, something terribly important about the history of categorization and distinction in the 20th century. But I do also want to suggest to you that what we should also take into consideration is that refugees engage with this process of categorization uh, and engage in cultural representations, whether they are like the model refugee or the, the young girl I showed a moment ago, or in institutions such as museums of migration. I just picked up this uh, leaflet for the Marienfelder Refugee uh, Center, and I was just today and yesterday in the Museum of Migration in, in Friedland. So I don't think I've got time, I, I know I haven't got time to go through each of these points in turn, but I do want to make two or three fundamental points. We can pass over the First World War, <clears throat> but it was nevertheless important as a time in which there were millions of people on the move, and in Russia in particular, an attempt for the first time to specify a refugee as an object of domestic concern. Most of these people were what we now call IDPs, or interna internally displaced persons. But then in the 20th century history, the aftermath of the First World War, you have a major manifestation of displacement as a result of the revolution in Russia, uh, as a result of the Armenian genocide of 1915, and refugees who become the object of specific attention and protection by the new League of Nations. The aftermath of the Second World War introduces a different kind of refugee regime. You have international and intergovernmental organizations, the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, the International Refugee Organization, which comes about in 1947, to manage the refugee crisis predominantly in Europe. By 1950-51, you have the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, which continues through to the present day. But the same kind of uh, situation in which multiple actors operate. So it's not just an intergovernmental organization like UNHCR, but states, which are members and pay money to UNHCR, and non-governmental organizations as well. With a key moment being the Convention of 1951, which specifies in international law uh, that a refugee is an individual who has a well-founded fear of persecution for certain sorts of, on certain sorts of grounds and with the core principle that a recognized refugee cannot be compulsorily returned to his or her country of origin. But in any kind of refugee regime, which might look very neat and very patterned, what is remarkable also is what is excluded, or who is excluded, as well as what is included. So in the 1920s, the League of Nations directly had nothing to do with the refugees who were created as a result of diplomacy at Lausanne in 1923. They were primarily the responsibility of the Greek or the Turkish state. 
Similarly, as is well known, I'm sure, in this audience, uh, ethnic German refugees, the Vertriebener, and other refugees from, uh, from the East did not come within the orbit of the new international refugee regime. And by the same token, that international refugee regime, uh, although it's called international, it was actually quite partial. So you have, in, for example, the partition of India with 15 million people moving from one part of the former Raj to another, uh, being the responsibility primarily of the Indian state or the state of Pakistan. They were not part of an internationalization of refugee assistance or protection. And the United Nations had its own organization for Palestinian refugees. And the refugees from, Hong Kong, uh, from China who ended up in Hong Kong uh, also fell outside the international arrangements of the United Nations. The end of communism, it seems to me, 1989 and beyond, there was no fundamental change in asylum policy that I think is worth talking about. But now we come to the present day and you have institutions around the, United, uh, around the European Union which is a kind of product of the, of the Second World War, in which the main focus is upon deterrence, the externalization of asylum, and even most troubling uh, critiques of the convention, not just of UNHCR as an operating institution, but critiques of the convention itself as belonging to a particular place and a particular time, no longer, in other words, relevant to conditions of 2015 to 2017, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, I shall skip this slide, except to say that what I'm trying to do here is to draw attention to the fact that there is always categorization, classification, a history thereof that needs to be written. And I do have quite a nice example of this from 1943-44, so the last stages of the Second World War in which a new institution comes on the scene, UNRWA, United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, whose job it is to manage the refugee crisis in Europe. And one of the key figures is a, an American Quaker of German origin called Hertha Krauss, and she drew up this classification standard for UNRWA in April 1944 which I'm not going to go through, but which I do like very much as an illustration of how an intelligent aid worker was trying to struggle, was trying to wrestle with, with making up people, with trying to organize people in an orderly way into this category or that category. And you can see that refugees and displaced persons were only one category amongst a whole list of others that she thought had to be distinguished, one from the other. And alongside her list, the, United, uh, the um, Allied uh, Army created this extraordinary flowchart, which you need to look at every aspect of it, but there's something very compelling as well as very uh, troubling about the, the mechanistic way in which you would identify people and sift them and spew them out, so to speak, at the other end. So the language of the, of the contemporaries was of people who were awaiting disposal as if this was kind of rubbish that they were talking about. And so some were awaiting disposal and at the very bottom you might be able to make out the, the box that says disposal. So you could be disposed, either returned to your country of origin, many of these were East Europeans, forced laborers, um, uh, but others were regarded as non-repatriable because they had objections, valid objections, to returning to um, Eastern Europe. And then in the same sort of vein, I've taken this from a, a very important book that was published by, a, I think he was Swiss, Jacques Vernard, in 1953, who was saying, well, now we have a UN, a UN convention of 1951, and the convention talks about political persecution as grounds for recognition. But what happens, he says, when refugees turn up, sometimes in large numbers, 
at the frontiers of the countries of asylum, and partly in order, order to secure a more advantageous status, and partly but mainly to avoid exclusion, sees any favourable opportunity to invoke political reasons as a cloak for their search for a better life. So what Vernon was doing in the early 1950s was to say, well, we have refugees and we, we think we know what a refugee is, but of course refugees are manipulating uh, the system in, in, in so many words in, in order to claim status as convention refugees, uh, but in fact, according to Vernard, they're really economic migrants. And he says, well, perhaps we can no longer talk about refugees or, or migrants. We need a new category, what he calls economic dissidents, so people who don't like communism but aren't persecuted uh, in, in terms of the 1951 convention. So I, I like this, and I offer it to you in order to reinforce the point that whenever these distinctions are devised and institutionalized, they're always under contest. There's always a dis disagreement and, and contestation. Something of that distinction also emerges in an episode that may be known to, to some people in this room, um, which is the expectation on the part of allies, Western allies, Belgium, France, Britain in particular, who saw the presence of displaced persons on European soil at the end of World War II as a, as a marvelous resource for contributing to economic renewal and economic reconstruction in their own countries. So the, the idea which you get in the United Nations of rehabilitation, rehabilitation, and which you also get in India and Pakistan at the same time, is that refugees can be an economic resource. They can work. But they don't just work as an, as it were, an addition to the labor force. Work itself is productive of their rehabilitation. They can be rehabilitated through labor. But you do get these uh, amazing programs, uh, European volunteer workers and Balt Signets uh, is a particularly um, interesting designation, which is recruitment from the DP camps of predominantly young, fit, single, preferably non-professional laborers who could contribute to economic reconstruction. But that belongs to a general a process or general family of, uh, of planned migration in the aftermath of World War II. But when you start to look at what refugees or Latvian DPs thought of themselves, they didn't like the word EVW, European Volunteer Workers. They didn't like the, the idea of being uh, economic migrants. They thought of themselves as refugees. That is what brought them to the United Kingdom, their status as having been persecuted. But the British government wasn't really interested in persecution. It was interested in a, a labor force. Um, a couple of slides here on the idea of refugees helping to make the state. This is very, very generalized, so you'll have to f forgive me. I've got one or two instances in the next slide. It seems to me that that if you're interested in refugee history, you have to be alert to the possibility that refugees make states. In the sense that uh, states are in the business of determining who belongs, who does not, where borders are to be drawn between one country and another, what resources can be committed to development of a new state, and refugees are caught up and contribute to that process as well. And you can find this in, in South Asia, you can find it in East Asia, in countries like Korea, this idea of the refugee as the figure of the nation, the, em the embodiment of, of national reconstruction or na nation state formation. Okay, examples of what I mean by that. Well, Russia in the First World War is a classic example, you have a calamitous episode of mass displacement, something like 8 million people, most of whom are ethnically not Russian, and who, as they find themselves in the Russian Empire, begin to think of themselves as Lithuanian, as Latvian, as Polish. So their very presence in large numbers 
helps to create a sense of our being targeted or victimized. And the committees that are created in Russia during the First World War create, in my argument, something we might call proto-states. There are bureaucracies that are created that help to crystallize a sense of proto-nationhood amongst those groups. It works in slightly different ways in other contexts, but I think if you go back to 1923 and this extraordinary population exchange, compulsory exchange, in which diplomats are creating refugees, diplomats create refugees, that the, the refugee citizen in a country like Greece becomes the target of development and state formation. So the state, as it were, develops itself in parallel with the making of the, the refugee as the object of development assistance. And even more, there's a wonderful book by Vazira Zamindar that came out 10 years ago now called The Long Partition. And what she does in that book is very carefully and closely demonstrate how the constellation, the, the constitution of the state of India and the state of Pakistan went hand in hand with determining who would get passports, what property rights refugees would have, and what resources could be committed to development. So rehabilitation, where well, you were rehabilitating the refugee, but the refugee was also creating the state. Okay, this, is, this develops a, a somewhat different argument. This is where I want to try and suggest that the historian has something to say to the present. Now, if we, if we look at Italy, for example, we can, uh, there's a very nice new book by Iriel Glynn comparing Italy and Australia, um, arguing that Italy has historically been, in recent years at least, a, a country of transit. Um, but is that all that is to be said about the history of Italy? This is not a criticism of Virial Glynn. It's, it's a comment on, on the way in which Italy is portrayed as, a, as a, a reception country. If we think of Italy only in those terms and what the politics of Italy has to say about the refugee crisis today, we ignore much of Italy's 20th century. The decolonization of Italy after World War II. The border politics between Yugoslavia and Italy in the wonderful work of Pamela Ballinger. Not to mention the distinctions, as she shows, um, that emerge um, between the Italian refugees, the refugees of decolonizing Italy at the end of World War II, and refugees from modern Libya, ex-colony of Italy, of course, who were regarded as completely uh, distinct and forming another story altogether. But we can think of these stories as linked rather than as, as entirely separate. Again, if we think of Greece as a refugee hosting country today, but what about the history of refugees in and of Greece at other points in time? Return of Pontic Greeks from the former Soviet Union in the 19. 90s, the child refugees who were created during the Greek Civil War, the refugees who were the result of the population exchange of the 1920s, and who, of course, were disliked heartily when they arrived, even though they were deemed national refugees, the local population of Greek villages and towns turned on them with contempt and anger. So if, my point is, if we thread these histories into the history of 20th century displacement, at least we can complicate far-right notions of, of Italy as authentically Italian, you know, mono, mono cultural, or Greece in the same sort of way. I mean, one would need to talk to, to Greek far-right uh, spokesmen and women and say you do realize that what you think of as authentic Greece, a lot of it is the product of refugees in the 1920s. Coming back to World Refugee Year, one of the things they did in 1960 was to each participating country produced its own stamps. Uh, the, uh, the German stamp is not very interesting, I'm afraid, the British one even less so, but the Greek one is extraordinary 
I think, because of Greece now. And, and you can see that the, the lower value drachma stamp is the boat being tossed along the, uh, the coastline, and then the higher value stamp, the rainbow, has, has cast its glow over the calm seas of a Greek port and sanctuary. But then, of course, in terms of iconography and cultural representation, so there, are no, there are no refugees. It's, it's an image of, of boats rather than of uh, individuals or, and no context uh, either. But it's a very beautiful uh, set of images, I think, nevertheless. So I've called this humanitarianism without the human. And then as I, I've got a, just two or three more slides... I wanted to, still in the same vein, thinking about... I, I, I do feel historians have a responsibility. I mean, not just as citizens, but, but you know, what is history for? And the historian, it seems to me, needs to argue politically and in public that if we focus upon the refugee crisis, meaning particularly the collapse and into civil war of Syria and its consequences for refugees. One of the consequences of that is that lots of other things are obliterated from our attention. So Western, where, where are the Western Africans? Where's, where's the Sahrawi refugees in, in, in this story? What about the refugees who are not so much hidden but sidelined on the margins? Palestinian, Tibetan, Cypriot, Afghan, Somali, you can Think of other examples as well. The histories of displacement that somehow get put into the background because we focus upon one part of the world. Uh, or, or Armenian Syrians. If we want to think about Syria, what about those who are of Armenian ancestry, ancestry who are now going to Yerevan, to the former Soviet Republic, now independent uh, Armenia? So there's a hidden history but then, as it were, there's the overt, or what I might call the omnipresent refugees, by which I have in mind Syria. Now, there's some, there are two recent works that may have been, I don't think they've been translated yet into German, because they've only just come out in, in English. One is a book called Refuge, authored by Alexander Betts and Paul Collier. And this is, amongst other things, very critical of German policy un under Merkel, um, but who's, who, who are making a, a broader argument, which I think is quite troubling. And the, the argument is troubling in at least two respects. One is that their recipe for a better refugee regime is to create economic zones in which refugees can, can work. And they have an example of Jordan in their book. But whilst their intentions may be good in the sense of refugees are capable human beings who should be allowed to work, the idea of special economic zones seems to me very um, problematic in, in terms of creating a kind of separate sphere of economic activity where refugees may be exploited. Um, but they also criticise UNHCR on the grounds that UNHCR is, is hand in glove with the Convention of 51, and the Convention has outlived its usefulness. Why? Because the Convention talks about political persecution, and their argument is that political persecution is not what is happening any longer, or not, not primarily. It's all about the failed state. To which my response would be, well, you could find plenty of failed states in the 20th century which produced refugees, and it was partly as a result of that that you get a convention in the first place. So why throw out the UNHCR and the convention uh, in this instance? It seems to be because what, what would you put in its place? What would, put it, what would you put in its place? And Slavoj Žižek, who, who writes a book every three months, uh, ha has a book called The, the Double Blackmail. Um, it's a short book. Uh, in which he says, well, we should neither open the doors to refugees uh, because many of them are culturally different from 
uh, European publics. Uh, nor should we close the door, he argued, because that would be uh, inhumane for some people. But he doesn't like either of those kind of uh, options as, as kind of absolutes. Um, so what he does is call for a new kind of Europe. The trouble is, a new kind of Europe, where, how, how long can we wait? You know, how, how long are we going to wait for a new kind of Europe? Um, and what kind of Europe will it be? So I, I would like to leave you with the thought that for want of anything better, can, can we not only think historically about the origins of the refugee regime in 1951 and its limitations, but why and how it might be strengthened rather than weakened? So, I have got two more slides after this, but these are my concluding remarks. We have to think of refugees as not just made, not just the byproduct of conflict. They don't just happen, but they're also made or fashioned into a legal and bureaucratic category that is always up for grabs, that is always being contested, but they also insert themselves, they also fashion themselves as active and plural historical subjects. I put the word plural there to emphasise that we're talking about men, women, different classes, different social origins, different ages, and so on and so forth. And a multifaceted history of Europe that incorporates histories and memories of displacement and replacement without neglecting the world beyond Europe. So let's, thought, let's think about Europe, but let's not just think about Europe. And finally, how history, my subject, can also stop us in our tracks, as it would make us pause when refugees speak or when sympathetic outsiders observe the human consequences of refugeedom. So these are my last two slides, I promise. Both from the First World War. Belgian refugee, part of that great upheaval that I spoke about earlier. I heard it, meant it's a refugee. The objectification, the dehumanization of this, but it's a refugee. Such an odd label, refugee. She, she was already thinking about the consequences of categorization. You're not to blame, you're destitute, and still they call you a refugee. We had become nobodies. But of course, I'd like to suggest that the nobody can become somebody. And then this one, which I think is even more remarkable. This is not a refugee, this is a Russian woman called Vistavkina who wrote an article in 1915 uh, which is called Ichdushi or, or Refugee Souls. Not so long ago these people lived a full and independent working life. They had the right to be just like us, indolent, rude, ungrateful. Now they have lost this prerogative their poverty and helplessness oblige them to be meek and grateful, to smile at people they don't like, to answer each and every question, to submit to the authority of people they don't respect and have no wish to know. And rather mischievously, as I was coming by train this afternoon, I thought, well, why don't I call this refugee souls or fire at sea in relation to the Fuoco Mari, the, the, the recent film that was Oscar nominated, where refugees are there but don't speak and they have to smile at people they don't like. And that is what I have to say. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, um, Professor Cottrell. Um, I'm, I think I've already seen the first hands and that indicates that we'll now open the floor for your questions um, I'll moderate them and um, please show your hands and we'll pick, we try to pick as many as, uh, of you as possible um, so please uh, try to keep your questions uh, concise and if you want to um, speak in German I can, oh, yeah. I can probably understand something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or, or you'll, 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 you'll find out when I give the answer whether I've understood it <laughs> So the first hand that I've seen, the asset, they in the middle. Yeah, 
Thank you. <clears throat> I tried in English. Thank you very much for your marvelous talk. Um, first, I want to know if you ever find out where these figures of refugees as a natural power comes from. Like the description of refugees as waves and flows who are coming over us. Is that um, a recent development or is it historical? Thank you. Uh, no. It's, is it, can I, it's, yes. yeah. uh, it, it's not a recent development. Um, I mean, when I was starting work on the First World War on this refugee history, I, I was very much struck by the language in which refugees were being described. And the language that they were being described is the language of natural disaster. So the watery, the liquid metaphors of flood or inundation are, are there in the contemporary descriptions. And not only images of a flood, but of volcanic lava, the volcano that spews lava. The, the refugees have become lava. Multi -mil I, the, the Russian term is multi-million lava. I can still, I can still remember it. Um, so, and I'm, I, it may well be possible to trace it back b before then as well. But I, I was very attentive to this, to this metaphorical uh, dis description, which has never gone away, really. Um, that. I mean, it has a particular resonance in Russia because Russia is a land of, you know, recurrent catastrophe, calam calamity. But to, to portray this, and of course it was also being related to things like uh, Mongol invasion, you know, the, the, the horde of refugees, which is a way of thinking about this so that people could easily understand in cult the cultural references that were being made. Um, so, yes, I mean, one comes across it in, in other times and other places, but there's... It's at least a century old. Yes. Uh, uh, good evening. Thank you very much for a very, very good lecture. Thank you, Thank you. at first. I would like to know if you agree or not with Bourdieu, because you say at the end the situation we have as perspective too, and if you think, as he said, he, he saw a world global and uh, nothing that we can do against because the situation, political situation we have with the globalization, it, will, it would be so uh, extreme that uh, perhaps the situations we have now. That's my question, because in America and in South America, we have European as refugees, according to the, to the classification from Hertha Kraus. Um, okay, I, I, I think I understand the, the comment or question. Um, I mean, part of, if we go back to uh, Zizek that I mentioned a, mo a moment ago, part of Zizek's uh, argument, not surprisingly, is, is that uh, it's all down to globalization. Globalization creates refugees. Um, I mean, I can, I can understand the, the argument, uh, but I do think that it is a partial reading of, of recent history that puts everything into this one, one category. Um, I mean, you know, where, where it, 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 he has to stretch the argument very considerably to say that everything can be reduced to globalization, that war can be reduced to globalization. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yes. you know, in some sense, yes, but it's a very, it's a very thin, it seems to me, very thin uh, understanding of, of a complex series of, of processes. So it can't be reduced to any one uh, process. Um, but if we're on the subject of globalization, I would, it may sound rather feeble as a response, but, but I would like to think of globalization not just as a process of recent history, but also the globalizing thought processes 
of many people who were thinking about displacement in the 20th century. In other words, not everybody, not everybody thought, well, um, we've got uh, a refugee crisis in, in Europe at the end of the Second World War, we need to do something about that. There were plenty of people, and not just secular, but also faith-based organizations. I'm thinking of Lutherans, I'm thinking of Quakers, who had a much more generous, if you like, global perspective on, on displacement. So I, I think it may be different from your question, but I, I, I like to think that although much of the history is written in terms of the nation state and its refugees, there is also a, a global dimension that we need to keep in mind as, as well. And is that, is that not helpful? Okay. Thank you for your speech. Um, right at the okay. beginning of your speech, uh, you mentioned about your record as a historian. And I think both of us would agree that it's a historian's task to, as much as possible, be objective in his narrative, mm -hmm. as well as to secularize the history from the politics. Given that the title of this conference is Europe, Power, and the Search for a New Migration Regime, and given the implications that politics nowadays has. So you have term limits, you have the popular vote on which politicians hang, and the uh, resources being limited. Yeah. What would you say are good solutions or optimal solutions to the situation? Uh, number one, <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, how, how can I respond in a way that, that does justice to your, to your question, which is one I do think about. Um, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to satisfy you with my response, but I will say this. Like the English fairy tale, once upon a time, one, once upon a time there were refugees. First World War, 1920s. 1930s and so on. So for those people at that time, that was the here and now. They, they, they had to think, what can we do? What should we do? What are the limits? Because the limits are also uh, legal and political and, and economic resources, so on and so forth. So I think one thing that the historian can at least do is to say to a politician or to a member of the public, just wait. Before you start parading your prejudices or your thoughts, maybe your recipes for improving things uh, and not just your recipe for you know, putting up barriers. Um, what, what is the history that you know? And you know, for, most, for most people, there will be a history of, um, let's, let's say in the UK, um, a partial knowledge of empire, a partial knowledge of the First World War and the Second World War, but then there's a kind of ancient history that has to do with Tudors and Stuarts, you know, Elizabeth and Henry VIII and all that. Um, but to be able to say, if you think you know the history of your country, and it's a history of, you know, the Battle of Britain, you know, that kind of thing, you, you do know that there are complex interwoven threads of that history which have to do with the history of refugees. Okay, now that person will then say, you've got me wrong. Uh, you're, you're telling me that I'm ignorant or I have partial knowledge or um, I'm prejudiced. Um, so I will say to you, you're a historian, you surely know that uh, Huguenots were admitted to, to Britain in the 17th century and uh, Jews came from Eastern Europe in the, in the 1890s and some Jews came in the 1930s, the kinder transport, and so on and so forth. Ugandan Asians in the 1960s. To which I would say, uh, okay, I know what you're saying. You're saying that Britain has a proud tradition of welcome. That's the mantra. That's the phrase that every politician, left or right, utters in the UK. We can do some things. We can't do very much. We're overcrowded. But in any case, we can hold our hands up high, heads up high and say proud tradition of welcome. It's like a parrot. You know, apparently le learns to speak. Proud tradition of welcome. Um, but the, the phrase is so ignorant of the history because that, that history was, was deeply infused with 
political complaint. We don't want you go to refugees. You know, what are, they're taking our jobs. Uh, you know, the J Jewish refugees in the 1930s, who, who, who opposed uh, Jewish refugee settlement? You know, doctors and dentists, who, for whom it was a threat to their professional in integrity. So this is a very long-winded answer to your question, but I, 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 I do think that the first thing that we can do is to say, don't ignore history and try and get your history right and separate it from myth. So myth is okay, but history is better. And in terms of, of uh, where we go from now, well, let's return to that. At, can we in 48 hours time? Um, but I, I do think you have to say to yourself, in 50 years' time, there will be a history to be written about 2017. So what, what will that history be? Will it be a history of, of, um, of exclusion, of deterrence in other parts of the world, forced repatriation, you know, the idea of what you do in, in uh, Kenya is to, is to repatriate uh, Somali refugees against their will from the camps in Dadaab. Um, I'd like to think that it was a history partly of policy that may be contemptible, but also a history of, if I can say it without being too romantic, a history of the realization by refugees of opportunities and capabilities that they showed at other times and other places. I'm sorry for going on so long. Thank you very much for um, the wonderful lecture. And um, so it happened that I come from, yeah. Uh, so it happened that I come from the country which used to be a part of two uh, state formations which dealt with um, the question of uh, Jews settling there in very different ways. Um, so Belarus used to be part of both Russian Empire and uh, the Commonwealth of Poland and Lithuania. Yeah. And those two states had very different um, kinds of responses whereby in the Commonwealth, uh, at least on the level of the state, there was um, some sort of inclusivity and uh, tolerance that was practiced. Um, and in the Russian Empire, we were to the west of the settlement line. And uh, this factor accounted for why um, we had up to like 60 or 70 percent of the uh, city's population being made up of Jewish people. Um, so my question comes uh, in the light of one of the first um, slides where you spoke of refugeedom and how it's the, um, uh, the arrangements for managing refugees which emerged as a practice in the 20th century. Um, and so my question is, um, are we really talking about the emergence of the term itself or the set of practices? Because uh, visibly from history, we can see how you know different practices were existing for a long time before the 20th century. Uh, well, you're, you're right, of course. Um, it's not part of my argument that there were no refugees before 1914. Um, and uh, I've already mentioned the Huguenots, and we can, we can think about other examples in which refugees were either valorized, were either kind of portrayed in, as a contempt, contemptible population, or indeed, on the other hand, as, as heroes, you know, the, the, the exile as, as, as refugee in, in 19th century discourse was, was, a, was a figure who could be admired and not just regarded with complete contempt. Um, but I think that there, there is something distinct, I would argue, there is something distinctive about practice in, and, and terminology in uh, the First World War because the, the, the practice that emerges turns upon the creation of this category of Biergensi or Biergenstwa. Um, and, and the reason it does so is that you have not only millions of people but you're trying to come to terms not only with a social calamity, but also with a question of who are they? What is their status? Now, one of the interesting things about Russia, I'm talking about the empire, so it includes the Belarusian part of the empire, 
uh, is that um, <clears throat> you have people who are organised according to certain kinds of, uh, well, in German, Stand, or in, in English, Estate, or Soslovia in Russian. Um, so everyone, in, in principle, knows where they belong in the hierarchy. Or you have, of course, an economic process of industrialization where those hierarchies become less meaningful, although they have a legal meaning, uh, because they are uh, working class or uh, poor peasants or rich peasants or whoever it might be. So you've got two competing kinds of categorization. You've got a, a traditional, if you like, and a modern categorization. But the refugee doesn't belong in either. So they're, they're trying to get to grips with this, with this person, this subject, who, for whom there is no language and, and, no, and no status yet. And I, I think there is something modern about that search for s creating a status for this figure who seems to be, as it were, otherwise unplaceable, cannot be placed within the existing political or social order. That's the point I I think I'm making. Um, professor, thank you for that wonderful uh, speech. Um, I just wanted to know that um, if, has there been in the history of refugeedom successful integration? Uh, if yes, what are the qualities of a successful refugee program? And if not, what are the usual unsur insurmountable obstacles? Um, well, that's another very challenging question. Um, I, I think my answer is that in 20th century history of refugees, you will find people, I mean, well-meaning, good people, well-meaning people, not, not bad people, uh, who, who say that we can find plenty of examples of successful integration of people who were displaced and, and integrated into their host society. Um, and most of those examples, are, well, some of those examples come from cases that I've mentioned, like uh, the aftermath of partition and refugees who come from the new Pakistan into India and, and vice versa, or the consequences of the population exchange, who are, who, who are successfully integrated, so the story goes. Um, now, of course, you could say to me, well, of course they're successfully integrated because they're ethnically, you know, they're, they're, they're Hindu coming to, or Sikh coming to India, and they're Muslim going to, to Pakistan. Uh, and the same with the Greece and population, population exchange. Um, but, and that example, the Greek-Turkish example, has sometimes been used, was sometimes used in the 19th 30s and 40s to say that maybe population exchange was a good idea. You know, it was, it was a way of resolving potential conflicts in the, in the future if you move people into their, as it were, homogenous place. Um, but of course, as I tried to say in my talk, um, even those examples of so-called successful integration are in practice a nightmare you know, for the people involved. Because they, they, or, or, the, or the Pontic Greeks, okay? I've read a little bit about Pontic Greeks um, in, the, in the 1990s, who, who come to Greece um, and everyone thinks, well, that's okay, uh, but, but they, their, their, neighbor, their relationship with their neighbours is terrible because they, they regard themselves as kind of, you know, we are more Greek than the Greeks. But, you know, we've, we've, we, we've been flying the flag for Greece for so long in, in the Soviet Union that, that we know what it is to be Greek and you're just kind of nothing. Um, okay, so now what about successful integration? Um, I worry, I worry about the, I worry about the terminology. I think, um, I think I prefer the idea of uh, how is it possible to make a livable life. Well, because because integration it's a, it's a loaded it's a loaded term. I um, mean, you know, when it, you know, it's 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 like like those words where you have to sort of just whoa, stop and say, wait a minute. Uh, what do you mean by integration? You know, who's integration? Integration on whose terms? Um, and uh, you know, I su suppose one can think of examples where um, where politicians will say integration has been successful. I mean, I'm sure there are people in this room who could answer this question much better than me. Um, but but all I would say is that what passes as integration is is usually a very painful process. <clears throat> 
and, and if we think, if we, if we could find a different language in which to speak, not the language of integration, but the language of, as it were, neighbourliness, or, or uh, the, the English language has a nice phrase about live and let live. Is that, is that also in German? Yeah, okay. Thank you again for the, for the talk and more, I would like to press you more on this uh, practical implications of historical reading uh, of uh, the refugee uh, uh, terminology uh, and regime. Uh, at some point in your talk, you, you sort of suggested that the, ex that the existing regime is a product of a particular time and that some aspect of it might no longer be relevant. Uh, I'm not so sure that you uh, hold this view, because maybe yeah. this was a claim that you wanted to reject, because at the end of the talk, you said that some of these suggestions, like Zizek and Betts and others, yeah. are uh, uh, problematic. So my question is, clarificatory, uh, clarificatory nature, do you think that the current regime is loaded by, fa is, is based on situations that are no longer relevant? And if so, which part of that regime needs to be changed, which facts have changed, and in what way? I mean, exactly which part of that existing regime is uh, dependent on things that are no longer relevant in the current situation? Thanks. Well, thank, thank you for your question. I perhaps didn't make it clear that um, there is, it seems to me, uh, in some political quarters and uh, in some refugee studies literature, a suggestion that We've, we've gone beyond the circumstances of, of 1951. I mean, you know, there, there, are, there, are, there are lots of institutions that change, they're no longer relevant, so why should we hold up UNHCR and, and, and the Convention as the kind of gold standard, so to speak? Um, and what I, what I, would, what I believe um, is that we can, as historians, or I, I can, as a historian, try to understand how that particular regime came about in particular historical conditions and circumstances, recognizing, of course, that there were many Cold War dimensions to that regime of 1951. But then as a citizen rather than as a historian, I say to myself, well, if, if you wish to argue that it is no longer relevant because persecution seems to no longer satisfy the conditions of many refugees, which I think is a very questionable uh, assumption, um, what, what do you propose to put in its place? And, and now s somebody perhaps in this audience will say to me, well, if you want to keep it, um, don't you understand that like even when it was instituted, agreed, it was the state that held much of the, much of the power. I mean, the states, states hold the final kind of position of arbitrage, arbitrage uh, in this. And I'm, I'm well aware that, that states come and go and, and states become signatories or, or uh, you know, sign up to this or that part of the convention. But I, I'm still deeply troubled by the suggestion that we dispense with it. Because, because in 1951, the convention was the, was the product of struggle. It didn't just come up overnight. You know, people talked about this for months and months and months before they, before they agreed on the convention. So who is going to do that hard work in 2017 if, 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 we, if we decide that it's, it's no longer relevant? So I think, foot de mur, uh, you know, it's the it's the best we've got, and I think it would be very foolish to say that something that has lasted for, for for 70, 80 years, ipso facto, needs to be needs to be thrown out. That's that's my personal yes. political view. Just going to the last question. Well, um, thank you very much. I'm happy that you're closing with this because I'm very concerned. Uh, about the potential erosion of the refugee regime and uh, the protection of civilians that are in migratory um, uh, movements. Um, I've just arrived from Mali, West Africa. Um, uh, uh, I'm going to speak tomorrow about uh, some of the issues that we are faced with. 
And uh, what I've heard from people who have tried to migrate, because we have mainly um, illegal migrants, is that to their knowledge already, what was there to protect them is not protecting them anymore. As a matter of fact, uh, and even refugees that have tried to cross Mali, and uh, we have had, for instance, Syrians arriving in Mali because um, uh, they thought the, the route was better through Mali to go to Europe. I mean, uh, just to, to think about how this, uh, how this comes to bear. Um, I wanted to underline the issue of power of definition. I think it's a power of definition of what is a refugee, what is an IDP, um, and the refusal that goes with that. Because if you are looking at a definition that is closed, then obviously you can say, ah, oh, this one is not persecuted. Um, uh, this one is not really a political. This is an economic migrant. Um, I always ask myself, you know, look in the mirror and say, what if it was me? If my child was dying, wouldn't I try? Wouldn't I try to go elsewhere? And um, I really feel, you know, uh, I wanted to go back to the man over there who said there's no money. I think there's a lot of money. It's just not given to the right, uh, to the right uh, uh, interventions. I mean, whether UNHCR is relevant or ir irrelevant, to me the issue is, are we willing as a human society to continue to protect our weakest? And are we willing to bear that responsibility? And my question is, what can we do apart from having these types of get-togethers where we talk to yeah. the converted, I would say? Mm -hmm. What can we do to impress on those in power to change some of their views? Because I do think nobody ever calculated what will it cost to bomb Libya. And I think bombing Libya was costing much more than helping, I don't know, 150,000 Malian refugees that are in poor countries around Mali. There is very rarely refugees who are reaching Europe. That is also something that needs to be taken into consideration. The majority of refugees stay around the area where they became refugees. So it's poor countries. And then the, the last thing is a moral thing for me. Who is responsible for the creation of refugees? You've made allusion to that. We are, in, in some way, we are as certain states involved in the creation and at the same time we're saying, but not please into our societies. Um, so the only question I have is what do you suggest that we do a part of uh, discussing this uh, in a historical manner and uh, how can we impress on those that, that have the definition of power to actually continue protecting human beings? Thank you. Well, I, I think I would reinforce the point that you make, which is that there is, there is a, something called political will, <laughs> but, but political will can be used or exploited in different ways. I mean, there's, there's political will that drops bombs, and there's political will that says that there are human consequences, and what are we doing about this? Um, I, I, I think in response to what you just say, I, I would underline my appreciation of the point that we can talk about refugees, but you know, what do we talk about when we talk about refugees? And, and are we talking about certain places? And what, what are the consequences as citizens, not necessarily historians, of, of focusing upon a particular part of the world and, and writing off all these other hidden catastrophes, that you, one of which you've, you've just mentioned? So I think that's an important thing that we, that we need to, to take into account. And the last thing I would say is, is that um, we can talk, as we probably will, about policy, about migration regimes, and all of that is fundamental, fundamental. But at the end of the day, to use an English cliche, I'm sorry, but at the end of the day, uh, we, we are also talking about people who are embedded in those power relations or those migration regimes. And l let us not ignore their capability, their possibilities for acting. The trouble is that very often, and I've said this before, refugees can't always get it right. If they're, if they're passive, then they're just, as it were, the objects of attention from governments or humanitarian organizations. And you know, the more passive they are, the more things have to be done to them. They have needs. <laughs> uh, those needs must be met. And that's terrible, because it, it then 
removes the other possibility in this, which is that refugees are, are conscious, deliberate actors with their own aspirations. They don't just have needs, they have wishes. And why is it that we can't turn the needs around into thinking about people with wishes? Um, as you say, people like us. Well, thank you. I think that is um, a wonderful conclusion <laughs> to, to the discussion. And um, maybe two things we've learned among many others is um, one that uh, historians have issues or hesitate to come up with a bullet plan and solutions. And it takes time and I hope we'll have the time to talk about these things during the next days and to get deeper in also in following this question, what can we do about it? One, I think what you suggest in a way is to hold up the mirror and hold it even higher. And maybe this is part to it. And the other solution is um, uh, that uh, the other uh, thing we learned is uh, that um, there is a way of thinking about and writing history that combines these often isolated instances of policy formation, categorization, and experiences. And there is a triangle that is somehow evolving and changing the subject that we look at. And there's a way of looking at it, and I think uh, Professor Cottrell has demonstrated us one way of doing this, and for that we want to thank you. <laughs>